Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Hey, what's up, Parasites? Welcome back to the Parasite Podcast. And today I have a very special guest because this person actually reached out to me and said, hey, I liked one of your videos and I'd like to use a piece of it in one of mine. And that blew me away. I don't get that offer very often. And what's funny about this is uh, I actually did this to somebody else recently too. So I was trying to pay it, pay it forward from your kindness. So Jay, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. How'd you get into YouTube? How'd you find my video? Like, I just, I'd love to know how we ended up right here today. Oh yeah, man. Um, so first again, thank you for having me. Uh, I really do appreciate it. My name's Jay. Uh, I run the Into the Deaths YouTube channel. I make uh, long form analytical uh, content. I talk about uh, comics, movies, uh, manga, pretty much anything I like. But my videos, um, I do talk primarily about comics. I'm very new at this. I've only been doing YouTube for about 10 months or something like that. Um, and it's Dang. been an interesting ride. Uh, been a fun journey and uh part of that journey has brought me here and i'm, I'm happy to be here yeah man and i, I will say like because i didn't want to interrupt I, I i love your videos by the way and I, some of my favorites are um i like that you talked about uh junji ito um and i mm. like that you talk about uh v for vendetta as well but obviously the crow and we'll get into the crow and some of your other stuff uh here soon but you make really great videos and for someone who's only been doing this for 10 months they're great. They're very detailed. They're very, they're very um, analytical. Like you said, that's a great way you're, you're doing like a, a beat yeah. by beat analysis of things. And that's the kind of content I typically watch on YouTube. A lot of people think, oh, you probably watch stuff like your videos. And I'm like, no, I try to make my videos short because I never think I say anything that interesting. Mm -hmm. But your but your stuff, I feel, is, is really good. And of course, the one of the few times I made a long video, that's one of the ones you happen to see, which is uh, <laughs> <laughs> Batman yeah. Night Cries. Um, so uh, real quickly, tell you know the viewers who are watching this um, who may not know her, because I'll be honest, no one watched that video until you shouted it out. <laughs> I think I had like 40 views on that video until you came along. So um, wh what is Batman Night Cries roughly about? And, uh, and who got you to read that book? And how did that lead you to the video you saw that I made? Batman Night Cries is a, a very different kind of of Batman comic. It, it's hard to compare it to anything else because there there really isn't much other mediums like it. Um, it deals with a very hard subject matter. Um, one we'll probably get into. Uh, but whereas other Batman comics deal with some heavy subject matters and kind of do it in the sort of a comic y way where it's sort of still in the mythos of the the world. Night Cries is very real and it it talks about these things in a very real way. Um so the first video I did on my channel was talking about um Grant Morrison's Arkham Asylum, a serious house on serious earth with um I love that comic. Great book. And it is it is and it's another one where it, there's really nothing like it. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's very, it, both night cries and Arkham Asylum, you know, there's nothing like them, but they couldn't be farther from each other inside in terms of like con you know, style and subject matter. Cause whereas night cries is, is hyper realistic and very gritty. Um, Arkham Asylum is like a fever dream. You know? Yeah. It's abstract. Yeah. It's very, uh, very, yes. Yeah. Um, so after, I made the Arkham Asylum video and people loved it. Uh, I got a lot of recommendations to talk about Night Cries and I had actually never read it. And it's funny because I've been reading Batman for years, but I hear a lot of people say they never heard of Night Cries and it's almost like, like DC kind of like sweeps it under the rug. Like there's something, you know, it's like, it's never been reprinted from what I know. Hmm. Um, and it's just, it's not a very talked about story. So I didn't know much about it, but I checked it out one day and I'm like, Oh, wow, this needs, you know, I, I wanted to talk about it because there really was not a ton of people talking about it. I mean, there was you and there was a couple other people, but it's it's a story that is important and should be talked about. And I was surprised, quite frankly, that no one was. It's, the thing is, is it's a really real topic. When that book came out mm -hmm. in the early 90s, um, it was kind of off the tone of the 
the Batman film with Michael Keaton. Um, mm-hmm. And at that point, Batman in comics was already like maybe eight or nine years into shifting into a darker tone, obviously. Right, um, right. And uh, we had, you know, five years before that, we had um, year one and things. So that was kind of the direction they were going with Batman. But I feel like that was one of those stories where Archie Goodwin, it felt personal. And I kind of liked in yeah. your analysis, in your analysis video, you mentioned how it's, you know, it, it, it hits the nose on, it hits the, you know, the, the nail on the head a little too much, you know, yeah. um, with yeah. its, um, with its message, like it kind of hits the nail on the head with its message a little too hard. Mm-hmm. And, and I agree with that analysis of it. Um, yeah, but I yeah. also, I also feel like that comes from someone who probably, who, uh, cause who knows uh, Archie, I don't, I don't, I idolized him, but I didn't know him personally. Right. Um, but I don't know if he went through something like that or if he knew someone who went through something like that, or just the fact that in the eighties, there was a lot of cases of that happening that were coming out more and more um, of child abuse and, and yeah, people, yeah. you know, and not just spanking your kid or hitting your kid once or twice, like really going too far. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that was just a topic that needed to be talked about, but I, I think you're right. They did they had vertigo back then, but, they they didn't have like a mature line so they kind of just put it out there as a one-shot magazine size and then nothing um and i don't remember a lot of press on it either and and actually the only reason i covered it on my show was because they did a re-release i think in digital form um so they they uploaded it to comiXology and and stuff like that um in like higher res images so as, as far as i know that was the only thing they did so that's what led me to make the video but i'm i'm interested that you had people saying Hey, make this, make this. Cause when I made mine, no one was asking for it. And I've made DC content oh, really? before, but no one ever mentioned it. And I said, why does no one talk about this book? So I went online, found like five people that made videos on it. And I said, I'm going to make a video too. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, well, I think a reason why, uh, a lot of people recommended it to me was cause I said that in my Arkham Asylum video that it was probably, I said that uh, a serious house and serious earth was probably the darkest Batman story I'd ever read. And people said that, well, it is dark, but this is by far the darkest. And, and that's kind of how people recommended it to me. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it is because it, because of the subject matter, the I subject mean, I, matter. Yeah. I think anyone with a soul doesn't want to see bad things happen to kids, especially. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that book really, it, it's, um, it, it makes you uncomfortable reading it uh, mm-hmm. at, point, at points. And, uh, I've always heard that some of the best art and horror and fiction will have that effect on you. I know, I know like silent Hill, a lot of those guys were like, we push the envelope because we know it makes people unsettled. Um, and sometimes you need that to kind of lock you into the message of the story. Um, so speaking on Batman, Night cries, like I would love to, cause the art's amazing. It's kind of like uh, Arkham. It's, it's like a painted style. Um, but it's realistic versus like McKean's like kind of abstracty look Mm -hmm. to Arkham. Um, what were some of the the moments in the book that like that kind of resonated with you while you were reading it for the first time? Um, well, you know, that's kind of the thing is I think the subject matter of the story of this just sort of like, you know, there's this big tone of like this just profound sadness Mm -hmm. um, that's happening. I think in a certain way, everyone can relate to that, but a big reason why I actually reached out to you was because even though I could talk about night cries in an analytical sense, I guess I, I tried to approach it the way I did with the crow comic where I, I tried sort of, um, and we'll talk about that, Mm -hmm. you know, video later on, but I, I wanted to sort of say something a bit more profound, but it's one of those things where, you know, I've had my, my hardships in life, but I was never abused myself from, from family or for anyone. Now, when I saw your video and I saw, you know, your reaction and, and your words, which I found very profound, I realized that I kind of have to, you know, roll my ego back a little bit and say, I'm not equipped to talk about this. And that's why I felt it was important to include your words. Cause I felt that you were someone who, who did experience that. And I felt that there was no way I could put it better than, than someone who's gone through it because I can only relate to it on a very, you know, rudimentary level. Um, and that's why I, I wanted to reach out to you in the first place. Well, I mean, like I said, it meant a lot. And when I made the video, cause mm-hmm. like I average maybe like, 
you know, 30 to 40 views per video, roughly. Um, I deleted a bunch of videos years ago and it, it really screwed me up in the algorithm of YouTube. And, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't realize I was, you know, that that was going to be the outcome of it. So that video, I knew a lot of people weren't going to watch it, but I knew some of the people who watch all my stuff would see it. And I, I guess I yeah. kind of wanted, I wanted to give them a hint that about that kind of stuff. Cause I don't talk about that, you know, my childhood mm -hmm. and everything. And so I was like, well, this is a great gateway to talk about this subject. And then I feel like if anyone kind of sees my reaction to it, they're going to know uh, that yeah. I've, I've been through something similar and in some instances exact uh, to that book. Um, so it's, it was a hard book. I mean, I, I spent mm. years trying to build up to review it. And then when I saw the re-release, I just felt like it was a sign, you know, like yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to talk about this and it's going to be awful and hard and difficult, but I need to get through this. I had just left California and moved here to Florida when, mm -hmm. that, when that, when I made that video. Um, and the, um, at the time I was actually diagnosed, misdiagnosed with, um, early onset dementia. Uh, I, I'm a brain wow. aneurysm, I'm a brain aneurysm survivor. So mm -hmm. they just thought, oh, this is like a, I'm forgetting like a couple days here and there. And at one point I forgot an entire week of my life and they, they thought, okay, well, this could be that. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll monitor you and, you know, you should, you know, should start thinking about maybe having a caretaker or caregiver and move closer wow. to home. And I was like, oh my God. Cause at that point I was, you know, 39 years old. So I was like, I feel like this is way too young to be going through this. And I'm sure everyone feels that way who goes through stuff. Um, so I, I moved back here. I moved over here and uh, to be kind of closer to family and stuff. And uh, turns out I was completely misdiagnosed and, and we found out that it was something all in the, on the other side of the spectrum, as far as that goes, where I have a, a version of DID called OSDD one a, so, mm, which is okay. like a version of multiple personalities and it, and they okay. tracked it back to this, like this stuff that happened to me as a kid that re resonates with mm. me in this book. Um, so that was the other big thing about reviewing this book was that it was, it, it opened a floodgate also. Um, yeah. because I don't actually remember everything that happened, but that's the point of me, I guess, is that I'm not supposed to. Um, yeah. And a lot of people don't. Right. And exactly. From my kinda, understanding, that's a very common thing. Yeah. You, you kind of shut it out. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, so anyway, so that, that's why I kind of resonated with the book and, uh, and why I thought it was a interesting book for Batman because it's, it's right after year one and it's pretty much the first case, according to the, the words in the book that Gordon is on as commissioner. Yeah. Um, and that it pairs very well with year one. Yeah. It's it's like, it's like, okay. Better so than year two does <laughs> yeah, <frankly. laughs> for sure. For sure. Uh, you're like, okay, this is like a year 1.5 or something. It's like after yeah. he met the Joker and then immediately after that or something. Um, yeah. so yeah, so I, um, but I, I thought the artwork was great. I thought the, um, the, the, the story itself, even though a little on the nose at times, but mm -hmm. the message is, was most important. And I, I commend Archie. And it's one of the reasons why as a, a teenager, I followed that guy's career and I wanted to so badly be just like Archie Goodwin. Uh, because to me, he was the first one to kind of get out there in, in my years of reading comics to talk about that subject. Yeah. Um, it, it's a real shame because whenever I make a video, so I, I love reading about the creative process. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm sure you can attest to this, but it's a miracle. Any comic or any movie or whatever gets made in general. It, it really is. Um, so I love reading about how something comes together and that's more or less when I decide to make a video, it's less about the, the content of the comic or the, the movie. It's more about the background and why, you know, what did the, the director or the author have to say here? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a shame with night cries that there's just not much background on it. And like you said, there was no real publicity. Like I found the closest thing I found was like a, a, a tiny interview with Archie Goodwin. He talks about it for like 10 seconds. And it's a shame because like you said, I, I do feel like Archie must have had some kind of personal experience, whether it was him or not, because I don't think you could tell that kind of story genuinely or as genuine as it does feel in Night Cries without kind of going through that. So, you know, we'll never know. But um, yeah, I, I wish we knew more about how it came to be. It's clear that whatever happened, 
Um, you know, how, however, Archie came to the decision to talk about this. It's clear that he felt it was important enough to cover it in, in the way he did. Yeah. And to do it with a character like Batman is huge. Cause mm -hmm. I, I've worked for these, some of these companies before and it's yeah. like, uh, it's, it's not easy to go like, Hey, we want to do a, a Spider-Man story where a, a child is, is dying from, and they're at the make a wish and they want to meet Spider-Man, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we, or we want to do a abuse, a child abuse story starring Batman. That is not an easy sell on a corporate level. Uh, you know, they're like, Oh, you know, so when those stories, like you said, just getting a comic or a movie is a miracle. Getting one like this is, is unheard of a lot of times. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, and I, I had the chance to meet, meet Archie, but, Oh, it happened. Pre, it happened pre aneurysm. So I actually have no idea what we talked about. Um, oh. I just have in my journal a picture of us and then just me saying like, oh, my God, I got to meet <laughs> one of my heroes. And yeah. uh, and I want to be just like this guy. And I actually later on became an editor in comics and writer because of Archie Goodwin. And uh, unfortunately, he wasn't alive at that point when I made that transition career wise. But mm -hmm. um, but it's because of him. I, I 100 percent attribute it to to that man. Um, and so, uh, yeah, he's, he's a great writer and he's a great editor. Cause speaking of year one, he, that's what led him to editing long Halloween, which is set kind of in that year one continuity. Yeah. Um, so he actually went on and said, you know what? My story is what it is. Night cries is what it is, but Jeff Loeb, he's a rising star. This was years later. And, and he was like, let's go back to the year one world. And I want you to write long Halloween. Um, so yeah, he's his that that part of him never left. I think he always had an affinity for that era of Batman uh, stories. Definitely. Um, yeah. But you were saying about creating things and and the people behind it because Archie's had a great career. Mm -hmm. But I want I want to use this too to transition into another creator who may or, I mean he this one we know for sure went through a personal experience that led yeah. to a creation of his comic, which is James Obar in The Crow. Yes. Um, and I know for people listening, we're in we're in heavy territory here. <laughs> but don't don't worry we're gonna we're that's we're doing this for a reason we're we're gonna get through the muck and uh and talk about the inspirations yeah. from that and then and bring you home after so so if you're if you're being, being bummed out right now please stay with us because uh <laughs> the crow is is really close and near and dear to my heart certainly pre-aneurysm when i was a kid and my mom mm -hmm. said it was my favorite movie she said i saw it seven times in the theater um <laughs> And, uh, and that I dressed like I had long hair. I had wore a trench coat to school, oh, up yeah, and, yeah. you know, like she was like, you were all into this. This is your favorite thing ever. <laughs> so, um, so for the crow, like what is, let's talk about the creative process, like of James Obar, yeah. what, what did he go through that inspired you to want to talk about it in the detail you did on your video? And by the way, everyone, I'm going to put links to the videos of his, uh, of, uh, of Jay's here down below. So please it, man. click on each video, go check <laughs> out his stuff and subscribe to him. So I got into the crow from the movie as I think many people did. Um, I just loved revenge films, uh, mm -hmm. things like old boy and kill bill. And I had heard that the crow kind of, you know, fit into that. And I just, I love that movie, you know, everything about it. Um, you know, from, from Brandon's performance, the, the cinematography, uh, the action, just it, it's, it, it, I, I I consider it almost a, a perfect movie in a lot of ways, even though, you know, yeah. as <laughs> something pretty, pretty bad came from it. Um, right. But to sort of go back to that later and kind of get back to the, the comic, um, I first read the comic. I was in a really dark place. Hmm. Um, and you know, to, to make a long story short, I was diagnosed with a autoimmune disease when I was about eight. Um, Sorry to hear And that. yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm 24 now and uh, it, it's affected a, a good chunk of my life. Um, you know, I would get really, really sick and then I'd get better. I'd, I'd bounce back for a while. Um, I think one time I was in like the seventh grade. Uh, I was taken out of school for like three months or something and homeschooled. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, by, I still was able to eventually get back. Um, you know, it, and it was during one of those dark periods where I first read the crow, hmm. which the comic is such a profound, um, 
it, it's such a profound look into sadness and and grief. hate and mm -hmm. grief, mm -hmm. but it's also a, a profound work of hope as well and, lo and love. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then you know later on when I start the channel, um, I want to talk about the crow because I, I love it. And um, that's sort of when I get into the background. Uh, mm -hmm. So as far as, you know, talking about the creative process and, and James O'Barr and, you know, the crow, whereas a lot of projects start as these sparks of inspiration, you know, um, the crow came from a point of just pure sadness and and grief um you know james obar is this guy um you know his mother was such an alcoholic she didn't even remember when he was born because she was just drinking through the whole pregnancy he mm -hmm. she just knew it was sometimes between christmas and new year's so the doctors said his birthday they just put it as december 31st right uh he then you know grows up in foster care moves from family to family some of them okay some of them not and most of them terrible mm -hmm. um goes to the army when he gets older uh comes back and he finds a sliver of happiness um in this this woman named beverly mm -hmm. uh they they fall in love and for the first time in his life he feels you know things are, are okay then one day uh when james goes out um he he can't drive his car because the tags are expired and he had already gotten a ticket so he calls beverly from wherever he is to come pick him up she leaves the house starts walking to the car and as she's walking down a, a tight alleyway a car a uh, drunk driver comes by and and uh she dies and um there's a quote James O'Barr had about it where he says, you know, I had this, this beautiful flower, yeah. um, this, this beautiful thing. And it was taken away from me and I didn't understand that. And it was from that, that moment of just why, why would this beautiful thing get taken away from me? Why would this, this one shred of happiness I have be taken away? And that's really where the crow comes from. It comes from tragedy. Um, he spends the next 10 years working on this comic. Um, there's everything comes from a real place. Um, it's set in Detroit where he grew up. Mm -hmm. um, everything comes from some kind of person or place he knew. Um, Shelly in the comic, who's Eric's fiance uh, is a direct one-on-one -on -one, uh, copy of Beverly. Um, and the moments Eric and Shelley share in the comic are moments James and Beverly shared in real life. And I think it's kind of clear to see why that took him over a decade to do because he had to sit there and, and meticulously, you know, illustrate all these moments and he said it was hell. It wasn't fun. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, an enjoyable process. But it was something he realized he had to do. It was, it was, it was hard, and it it sucked. But just getting this emotion on paper kind of sucked out the the poison from him. Um, and the actual story of the crow, as you know, it's about this guy named Eric. Um, one day when him and his fiance are going down, uh, their car gets broken down on the side of a highway. Some not very nice guys come by and, you know, do some pretty bad things and Shelly dies and so does Eric, but Eric eventually comes back as this sort of vengeful spirit. And, um, you know, he, it, to, to call the crow, the comic a revenge story is i feel like really underselling it, it it's it really yeah. is more it, it's a forgiveness story because more than revenge it's about eric forgiving himself 
for, you know, I guess being in, in Shelly's life and putting her in that situation, much like James had to forgive himself for, you know, calling Beverly that day mm -hmm. and, and asking her to come, you know? Um, and there's, there's things like that in life where we know realistically we couldn't have known, you know, but it doesn't mean there still isn't guilt. It doesn't mean sure. there still isn't that pain. And that's where, um, you know, the real story for the crow lies. Now, I think the part for me that helped me out of this is that though the crow comes from a, a tragic and dark place, it's not a tragic and dark story. I actually find it a, as hopeful. Hmm. It's saying that as ludicrous as ridiculous as it might seem to hold on to that whatever little shriver little sliver of of hope you have left through all the darkness um you have to that because when you let go of that that's the only time when you you're truly lost and you've truly lost everything um and i think in, in the movie it, it says it too um you know when when eric says he's talking to um you know, the little girl and he says, it can't rain all the time. Right. And I remember when I first heard it, it didn't mean all that much to me, sure. but when I was getting sick a lot as a kid and I'll tell you, um, a couple of years ago, 2021, 2022, uh, my health kind of hit rock bottom and ended up getting about four surgeries back to back. Jeez. Um, and that's kind of why I started the YouTube channel in the first place. I just had a lot of free time. I couldn't work, go to school, but I remember sitting in the hospital bed and just being depressed. But I remember like, it was like a, a moniker. I just kept saying it can't rain all the time, which hmm. to me, I think it just means, you know, things are horrible now, but does it mean they can't just get a little bit better? And that just shriver, you know, small piece of, of hope is what you need. That's yeah, I mean, I mean, that's first of all, thanks for sharing, you know, yeah. some of these personal stories with us too. And, um, and I mean, our, we are, you and I mirror a lot. I, I know what mm. it's like to wake up in a hospital and have to deal with what that means and, um, yeah. after surgeries and stuff. So, um, I'm just glad we both end up meeting each other and, and got brought together <laughs> I, through yeah. these, through these amazing stories, like, like the crow and like, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I follow James O'Barr's career. I've met him a few times mm -hmm. as well. And, and he's um music was a big inspiration too. And I think bef before him, it's according to my mom anyway, she's like, you liked music. I was a big Prince fan as a kid. She said, mm -hmm. um, which makes sense. He also did the Batman soundtrack, the first one. So I was like, yeah, Oh yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Uh, but she said, uh, the crow opened your eyes to a, a different style of music. And she said, and then you just got really into grunge and rock you know and, and all these other different styles of of music uh, even hip-hop and rap and and oh, she yeah, was like yeah. she was like you got into a lot of stuff because you heard james obar talk about music and how mm -hmm. iggy, iggy pop inspired him and all these you know great yeah, yeah, great, yeah. great musicians and and uh and that is to me like um and it's you know that's one positive to take away is music like you know crow, the crow and stuff like this like did did for you where Mm -hmm. music music saved me from going down a spiral you know mm -hmm. uh, a negative spiral and uh and yeah. but by hearing musicians talk about their pain and sing about their hope and sing about their passions kind of showed me that like james obar did to you mm -hmm. having this like uh you know, having this art form is a way to process and get through some of the most difficult things in your life yeah. you yeah. know um and then you finding YouTube, same thing. Like the YouTube became therapeutic for me and helped mm -hmm. me through stuff. It helped me after my aneurysm, I, I had trouble talking. So I joined a podcast like a year later to get into the rhythm of talking a lot, you know, right, uh, right. and, uh, and, and finishing paragraphs as opposed to just speaking in like monosyllabic <laughs> sentences. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, so I, I love that that's the reaction, um, the positive that comes out of this stuff, a story yeah. so dark like the crow and the in the origins of it like you said with james losing the love of his life like that you know being an, an impetus for yeah. a, a comic that he was like i'm gonna 
I'm going to be like Dante. I'm going to go through hell to make mm-hmm. this book. But in the end, I'm going to find my Beatrice, my Beverly, and we're going to both ascend, hopefully in a better place after this story is told. And, uh, and I hope that's the, the, the ending, you know, for James Ober. I know he probably sees that franchise as like a, both a, a, a genuine relief and a curse in some way, because obviously yeah. then, then the film, you know, he made friends with Brandon and then Brandon's taken away. Yeah. Um, and I can't imagine what, what that would do to anyone. Um, but I know that he hasn't given up on art at no, least, no, and he still yeah. puts stuff out from time to time and he's still amazing. And, uh, and I, and I love the crow Re- reading it is like, it's so cool. Cause there's like just splash pages of poetry in there, um, yes. yeah. you know, and song lyrics and, and there's just like great, beautiful drawings of horses, <laughs> you know, it's like mm-hmm. all these things that you're just like, wow, the contrast is, uh, yeah. I'm, the I'm symbolism remember, too is just so uh, beautiful. It's, it's so good. I mean, there's yeah. so, yeah. And you said about hope and positivity. The movie mm-hmm. does a really great job at that because, yeah, you know, Brandon, he he sucks the morphine out of uh, Sherry's mom, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and or is it she- no Sherry? Is it, uh, who's the little I, it girl? Was, it was Sarah. Sarah, that's it. Sarah. Sarah. Her, yeah, name, her yeah, name's yeah. Sarah. Um, and so in Sarah, he you know he um, gets her mom to spit out the morphine. He mm-hmm. get, then her and her mom, you know, Sarah and her mom, have a chance to have a, a funny. They make each other laugh at breakfast. Yeah. So there's there's hope. Like they were they were going down a spiral. Um, and, and then Eric pulls him out of it. Um, officer Albrecht, uh, he yeah. comes out a better person at the end. He was someone who was a good man, but spiraling and, uh, and on yeah. the verge of, on the verge of tipping until he saw Eric Draven again. And, uh, I loved all of that. And I, and what he kept up in his mind being the, the thing that Eric used to win the day, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, to being there by Shelly's side for him, like, just really cool that movie uh, how how thematically everything comes back together um even in some ways better than the comic i mean the comic does some things better but the mm-hmm. movie the movie did some things better too and I, that's why i think that movie resonates with with people when they watch it is uh it's just cool it's rock and roll but it's like there's a love story there and there's yeah. hope you know and there's revenge it's got a lot of things in it um for sure um uh, well, well any last th- thoughts on the crow i mean i, I know there's been sequels but I don't really like talking about the sequels. Uh, <laughs> I, I I like talking about the second one because there was a there's an original cut of that that is really good that mm-hmm. you know the world needs to see. I feel, um, but uh, you know, so release the Pope cut, I guess. Uh, but oh. uh, but yeah, I know I don't want to go through that. Uh, but still, um, you know, the other ones you're just kind of forgettable. But uh, that's great that like you know that that book meant so much to you, and, and I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just sorry. Like, and I always say this to folks and people always go, why, why are you saying you're sorry? You have nothing to do with my health. Nothing, you know, and I go, no, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but I feel like someone has to apologize. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just take the role of apologizer and just say like, um, I'm sorry you went through that, but I'm, I'm glad to see you still on your feet. Yeah. And, still, and you make great content, man. You really do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm very new at this. I'm still trying to figure it out. I, I'm, I'm a very like hypercritical person person of myself so i i I always i'm never happy with anything i make but other people are and that's what's important yeah me too i mean i I most people are like i liked your video that and i was like i I could do i gotta do better i gotta do yeah yeah (laughs) yeah um i mean we work with what we got right so so we're doing we're doing our best but i just i'm always it's easy to say that but i never take my own advice on it (laughs) yeah yeah um but yeah um to to sort of give a closing thought on on film um it, it's you know you're talking about how your mom said that film kind of opened you to different kinds of music and uh, the thing is though it, um that film opened a whole generation to a different type of lifestyle like yeah. music clothing it really oh yeah i think people realize i mean they know the film played a big role but i don't think people realize how big a role it played you know it, it's it, it, it's hard to talk about the film because again, you can't help but go back to to Brandon and thinking mm-hmm. of like, I, I mean, there, there's, I say something in my, my video on it where I say that, um, you know, just like the crow was birthed from tragedy, tragedy was birthed from the crow. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, of course it's sad. You know, he was such a, a young talent, um, you know, and, and to go like that is, is sad. You know, I, I never, I first watched the crow, I think when I was like, 12 or something mm-hmm. you know i'm i'm 24 now 
Mm-hmm. And Brandon was was 28. And like being 24, I never realized how little life 28 is. Like to think like I yeah. could live four more years and then like nothingness, that is very sad. But I, I don't want to like take that away from from I think the beauty that does come from that film. And like you said, you know, there is this this you know profound hope as well. Um I, I can't explain why, but whenever I you know, go through a dark period. If I just put on his guitar solo when he's on top mm-hmm. of the roof, <laughs> yeah, it it's just, so good. I, I don't know. It just, it, it, you know, it makes me, um, it makes me realize, you know what? It's, you know, I can get through anything. That's great, man. Yeah, and you're right. There, there's something. Uh, some people are like, "Well, that's an aggressive song." I go, "It's very uplifting." That solo. It, it, yes, it, it really is. If you really just sit and you listen to it. It, it makes you want to get up and do something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that, yeah. And um, I'm, I'm just, it's so cool that like, I was like, man, I can't believe how much we have in common. I, I, my mom told me too, that I also saw the crow when it was 12, but that's when the movie came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so you're, you're a younger. Was on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. But that's yeah. cool that you end up seeing it then too. And, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then yeah, 28 was uh, when I had my aneurysm rupture and, and, and mm. I flat, I flatlined for a short blip there. And, and, uh, oh, yeah. and so to mirror to mirror that, like, I know my mom every day is like, I'm so glad your life didn't end at 28. And I'm like, yeah. well, yeah. I mean like how crazy that would that have been as, as much of a fan as I was of Brandon Lee, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad to still have these other years. And even if they're full of pain and a little bit of suffering at times, like I'm still grateful. Like it's, it's a, uh, it's, uh, I'm glad I'm getting a second chance to, still do things that I I wouldn't have been able to do when I was, you know, younger. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And that's the, and I feel like that's the positive stuff. And that ended up leave it leading me because you were talking about earlier how you, um, what led you to make videos on YouTube and you started with Arkham Asylum. And for me, it was different. It was, uh, I'm actually my, you know, Brandon, I would have said probably pre aneurysm. And when I was younger, uh, that alter or, you know, that person who lived in us, that, that was his favorite actor. For me, is Tom mm-hmm. Hardy. Uh, I, like a uh, post aneurysm. Some of my first movies I watched were with Tom Hardy in them, and I fell mm-hmm. in love with the guy. I was like, "This guy's amazing!" Like, holy cow! Um, yes, yes. And so, <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. And when he when I saw that he got the role of Venom, I was like, "Holy crap!" I was like, "Well, I know a little bit about that character." And of course, my mom's like, "Well, you don't remember before twenty eight, but you know, you loved Venom as a kid too." So mm-hmm. I was like, "Well, cool. This could be a way of me reaching back and trying to connect with my." you know, 10 year old self and, uh, and, and let him kind of live through me and do this show. And I honestly thought it was because at that point I was ready to give up on YouTube. I was on YouTube for, I think four, almost three and a half, four years. And I was doing okay, but you know, I was still at like 400 subscribers. So I Mm. was like, I was like, yeah, I'm not really growing at a good rate. And, and I said, uh, maybe people just don't find me interesting. I said, so I'll, this is my last ditch effort. I'm going to talk about venom for a couple episodes and see if people like it. And if they do, we'll keep doing it. And mm. here I am 860 episodes later, <laughs> uh, do, still talking about Venom. People are like, how you, haven't you run out of things to say? I'm like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're just waiting for the third movie to come out. And I, my plan is to end at episode 1000. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but you know, so Venom is a character that he kind of means a lot to me. And especially the duality, like I resonate more with him now as someone with, mm-hmm. that's part of a system of, talking to an internal dialogue, you know, inner voice. Um, do you have any experience with the character at all? And like, uh, and if so, do you have a favorite iteration of him? Yeah. Um, I do like the Tom Hardy movies. Uh, I okay. wouldn't say they're my favorites or anything. Um, they're not high art or anything. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, they're fun. They're, they're, they're really fun. fun movies, especially the second one that got. It's so goofy. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's my thing is like, I like the second one more. Because the first one, it felt like it was kind of conflicting, I guess, with are we going to go more the the serious comic sure. like Venom or the fun sure. side? And the second one was just like, ah, screw it. Let's just go all balls to the walls. I, I respect it more. Um, you know, they're not the most faithful adaptation, I suppose, but really none of the like Spider-Man like movies are exact adaptations. Mm-hmm. So I think Venom could get a pass too. <laughs> um, I, you know, for me, Venom will always be Eddie. Um, I love Eddie as a character, uh, his, I love his complexity, the internal struggle between Eddie wanting to hold on to his humanity. And then you have Venom who wants complete control. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't read as much Spider-Man as I have Batman, but two comics I love 
are Birth of Venom and Maximum Carnage. Cool. Um, and I think those comics pair very nicely together because they show two very different sides of the character. I think Birth of Venom shows more of uh, the Venom side, while Maximum Carnage shows a little bit more of of Eddie. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's um, a great way to put it. That's actually yeah. a great way to put it. Uh, I also like whenever Mac Gargan becomes Venom. I think they call him like Scorpion Venom. I just think yeah. he's, I like to design. Uh, and I haven't, I guess, I guess I can say that for Agent Venom as well. I haven't read a ton of Agent mm -hmm. Venom comics, but I do love the design. The um, design's awesome. Flash Thompson is, is awesome he's design. he's a great Venom. If you ever get a chance to read that run, you'll go. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. He's he's probably second to Eddie. He's really good. Yeah. yeah I, I've read a couple of them here and there, but I, I should sit down and, and go through them all. Um. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I played the Spider-Man 2 game and, and really hope we get a standalone Venom game because his section was probably my favorite in the entire game. Yeah, when you got to play as him, I flipped oh, out. Yeah. Uh, I flipped out. Yeah, I streamed cool. my playthrough of it, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I was like, I can't – people were hearing. I was like, oh, my God, we're playing as Venom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. That did you – um? so overall, what, what were your feelings on that game? Uh, did you like Spider-Man 2? Oh, um, yeah, I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I – um. You know, I feel like it, um, I don't know. People say kind of uh, played it safe here or there. I, I don't know if I agree. I, I think okay. it did take some some chances. Um, uh, Craven's my favorite Spider-Man villain. Hey, me um, too. No way. Oh, that's, I love Craven. That's so amazing. I love Craven. That's um, cool. Yeah, I, I. so of course having him in uh, was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, different craven i guess you know he's sort of like this almost like cult leader in a way yeah, he's got to have goons in a video game yeah but, yeah but he's still uh, he represented he was a good craven though i felt like a good oh no, no yeah yeah he yeah. was a great craven and it, again that like the last uh the section with with when you're venom and fighting craven oh, that was i think the highlight for me i think the highlight um no i i i loved the game i thought it uh gameplay wise like movement wise uh mm -hmm. It's so like I, I in the first game, I would just boot it up and do nothing else but swing around. Okay. And just because it's just it's so fun to swing around in these games. Sure. Oh, yeah, and it is. For, for Venom 2 or for Venom 2 for uh, Spider-Man 2, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to be doing that as well. It's just the movements fun, the combat. No, I, I love the game. Yeah. Yeah. I hope uh, whatever the Venom thing they do or the DLC, whatever, I hope they pay, <clears throat> yeah. off, pay off that that side story with um with uh with cletus um the flame yeah yeah um yeah. that would be cool if that's kind of how that story wraps up because people are like oh he's got to come back for the third game and i'm like i don't want symbiotes in the third game uh i know i'm the mm. venom vlog and i talk about symbiotes every time but i don't want the i don't want symbiotes in the third game i want the third game to be about you know norman osborne wrap up the story with um, yeah. Doc Doc and maybe put the chameleon in there and i that's what i you know, wrap i was about to say they because they also uh Hint at the the chameleon as well, which is actually my my second favorite uh, Spider Man are, villain. Are we um are are you gonna go see the Craven movie when it comes out? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm divided because it's like I, I love the character and the casting's not terrible. I think Aaron Taylor Johnson's a great actor, but I, I like uh, you know I love Aaron Taylor yeah. Johnson. Um, I I loved uh, Kick Ass. Yeah, um, and I, I thought he did great in it. I mean. Maybe. Yeah. I, I don't guess, know about buying a ticket, but I'll, I'll see it eventually. <laughs> yeah. That's one of those where I feel like if my friend invites me I'll, and I'm like, oh, you buying tickets? Okay, I'll go. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Cause I didn't see Morbius in the theater and everyone's like, dude, you're the Venom vlog. You, you got to see all the Sony stuff. I'm like, no, I don't, man. I, I don't have a contract yeah. with anybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm the Venom guy, not the Sony guy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I tried it for a minute there when I heard they were going to do a shared universe. I was um, like, okay, maybe we'll explore some of these other characters. And I made like two Morbius videos and I didn't even watch them. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I was like, yeah, some of these characters aren't interesting uh, enough to do videos on. Um, but Craven, we're going to do a whole series leading up to the movie. I'm going to do a whole uh, on the Venom vlog, uh, the, you know, the Craven's last hunt, Craven's oh, first, that'd be great. you yeah. know, Craven's first appearance, soul of the hunter um, and his resurrection. Uh, I'm going to talk about all those books. Yeah, coming up. I, I, I want to talk at some point. I'm going to cover Craven's last time. Uh, dude, I can't wait. When you make that video, I'm going to be there <laughs> waiting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so that's uh, but that's cool that like 
I don't know. There, there, there's a lot of positivity out of like this stuff. I know some of these, like we talked about earlier with Night Cries, heavy mm-hmm. subject matter, uh, the Crow, heavy origins that led to the creation of the comics. But mm-hmm. there is, unfortunately, that's that's life where there's like this this nugget and a big chunk of tragedy and and, and grief and, and awfulness. And then there's almost an equal amount of positivity that can come from it. Yeah. Um, you know, not always, and sometimes not even for you. Like you may be the person that creates, you know, these comics, but it brings light to someone else. Doesn't make you feel any better, but it, it, you know, it means something to somebody. And that's the thing about art is, uh, you know, that's what's so powerful about it is that yeah. uh, is that we it, it uplifts you. I and mean, like you even said in your, uh, you know, your video for V for Vendetta, where it's like a comic that started a revolutions, basically. Mm-hmm. Like uh, that's 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 what comic books can do. They can and art in general, Absolutely. music, movies, yeah. like. They get you up and want to do things, you know. They want you. Sometimes they make you want to create, and and that's such a um, an amazing, uh, you know, uh, I guess like uh, effect of these things. So, what is something that you know? I know the crow is up there, but something that mm-hmm. maybe you've ingested recently that either you're new to that's been around for a while, or something you jumped in on while everyone else jumped in on it that just brought you to that level where you're like, oh my god, I f- I feel something uh, just positive things from this if you have anything oh man so um i love horror um, okay movies games comics everything um and i've never been like a huge manga reader okay um my friends got me into it like a couple of years ago and i that's when i got into junji ito Great. and i went insane like i <laughs> whole collection behind me Uh everything just i i it's so different where it's like it's you know like such grotesque imagery but such like creative unique stories it's like i don't know how to describe it the way i describe junji ito i guess to people is that not all the stories are great Mm -hmm. but not a single one's forgettable yeah oh for sure (laughs) yeah Yeah. like like you're never (laughs) gonna forget a story you read you know he might be sort of up and down as an author but but as like someone that can make something stick and and sort of like sear it on your brain (laughs) definitely so yeah i i love um all his stuff and actually um other than youtube i actually inspire to be a a writer and a filmmaker cool Um, i want to eventually make my own horror um films and i'm working on two projects right now um both in early development but one of them is actually an adaptation of one of junji ito's short stories oh wow cool yeah <clears throat> all right sweet so you're doing like a is it more of like a fan film you're doing um or or do you would just say it's like inspired by that story um no i i'm working more on a fan film basically it's okay. sort of a direct adaptation um, cool. that kind of explores the concept a bit more um yeah uh something else i'm working on is is kind of my own thing it's sort of a, a satirical uh black comedy horror um that's been the main thing i've been working on that's awesome i and i'm like you i like darker things too like i yeah. i've actually Pre aneurysm, I wrote a Spider Man four screenplay. Uh, I used to work at mm-hmm. Sony, and mm-hmm. after sp- and we were there when Spider Man three came out, and four was like they were really divided on four. So mm-hmm. so me and a couple friends that I guess worked at Sony with me all wrote a Spider Man four script, which is funny because I've I've read a like a version of that script out on the Venom vlog uh, mm-hmm. like five or six years ago, and in it I talk about how our script was, it was Spider-Man versus lizard. Um, okay. but that, but, uh, the opening scene was Bruce Campbell as Mysterio. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then, cause I was like, we got to get a Bruce Campbell cameo in here. Cause yeah. we were assuming Sam Raimi was directing it. Right. Um, and then we, so then, uh, so, oh yes, yeah, so the lizard is Kurt Connor still had a sliver of the, the symbiote at mm-hmm. the end of the third Spider-Man movie. So we had him, working on that splicing in reptile DNA. And that's what turns him into the lizard. So when he's the lizard, he's kind of, it forms over him like the symbiote a little bit. Um, And then we had Craven was the other, the other villain. Um, And so Craven comes to New York to kill Spider-Man, but then in 
sees him battle the lizard and the lizard beats Spider-Man to an inch of his life. So then Craven goes and buries Spider-Man and then proceeds his hunt of, okay, the new king of the jungle is now the lizard. And then you have a scene where Spider-Man, you know, is alive and crawls out of the grave <laughs> that, that Craven buried him in uh, to mimic that comic cover. And then he yeah, recuperates uh, last hunt. Yeah. 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 The last hunt. And then he recuperates and then goes and st- his mission is to stop Craven from killing the lizard in the final battle is in Times Square. So I just thought it was so funny when I was playing Spider-Man 2, the video oh, game. Yeah. I, was, I was like, man, there's so many similarities, um, but it makes sense. I mean, like when you use these characters, there's not a lot of yeah. stories you can tell. <laughs> so of course that's the trajectory a lot of yeah, times. You're always going to kind of end up in the same place. Yeah. So- and yeah. So, and I had lizard like try to eat Craven's head off, uh, but Spider-Man oh, stopped him. Okay. So I was like, holy cow, there's so many things in here. Um, <laughs> But uh, but Resident Evil, I'm a big Resident Evil fan, and that actually led me to write a, a Resident Evil screenplay a few years oh, ago. Me too. Me too. Um, so that's so that's cool. It's just funny, like everything you say that you love. I'm like, God dang, me and this guy are like best friends. Like that's <laughs> all, <laughs> I'm like, I love everything yeah. you said. Like I'll, every Craven's my favorite villain. Uh, Resident Evil, I'm a fan of Junji Ito. I got turned on to him by my friends Kevin and Alex in California. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin, he used to work for Howard Stern, and and he works. Uh, oh he, really? He, yeah, and then he did a show as. Uh, he does his own podcast now called MSPH Mad Scientist Party Hour. And he uh he I was roommates with him for a while and and mm-hmm. he had all this Junji Ito stuff. I'm like, what is this? So one day he sat me down and like went over it with me and I was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I'm I mean, I'm yeah. so in. Um so that's that's cool. I'm glad positivity comes out of it. I'm glad creativity came out of the stuff. And I, I want to hear updates whenever you um yeah, I know I'm gonna let you cook, obviously, but anytime <laughs> you want to do an update or if you ever are looking for someone to watch like when your finished product comes out of your short film and you want people to review it, like, sh- you know, I'll watch it. I'll do a video reaction video, whatever you want me to do, man. I'll, I'd oh, love nice. to support. Dude, I'd love to support you. your art. Yeah, of course, nice. man. Thank you, man. That's You're great. very welcome. And, um, you know, I want to end on that note because it's, mm-hmm. I feel good. I feel good now. We started off in yes. the must- Yeah. And I'm yes. like, Oh, we're talking about creating now. And, uh, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So I'm, I'm glad you're at that point in your life, but no, sorry. You know, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, no. Um, no, I was saying we, we, you know, <laughs> we, we got through the rain and, <laughs> yeah. and, and we're here, we're here. Um, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of similarities between us and I, that's kind of what you were saying earlier to sort of the power of comics and mm-hmm. art in general that to, you know, the, the both of us sort of living very similar lives, similar interests and somehow found each other from this this one comic that you know not many people talked about and i think to that just holds the power of of storytelling and really shows how powerful this thing can be i agree my mom she would tell me like um she's like when you were a kid she's like my mom's just like she's one of my favorite things about you and she goes and i don't know where you get it from because Mm -hmm. she's the opposite she she would say but she'd go you're not a gatekeeper and she's like, mm. ever since you were a kid, if you were into video games, comics, like you it, movies, you were into all of it, music. Yeah. All you wanted was more people to like it. So you would be like, hey, read this so we could talk about it, you know, and Absolutely, watch this yeah. so we can talk yeah. about it. She's like, you were like a recruiter for all that stuff. And uh, and she's like, th- she's like, to the point where companies should have paid you. <laughs> she's like, because yeah, you would yeah. just talk to strangers sitting on a bench, you know, just walk up to a kid in a, a Batman shirt and go, hey, have you read this Batman comic? And you know, so I think people who have that mentality, it sounds like you do too. It's like, mm-hmm. we, we just want to find more people like us because yeah. we know there's a lot of us out there, <laughs> you know? No, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's why I, I like to talk about comics or, or movies or whatever that aren't, haven't been heavily talked about or kind of like unknown or, or maybe like kind of cult movies. Cause you know, I, I, again, like you said, I love sharing things I like, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I have this weird thing where like, I get like mad if someone hasn't watched something I watched, I'm like, there's no reason for this. It's dumb, but like, how can you not watch something so amazing? (laughs) I get that. I, um, yeah. So then I have a recommendation for you before we we end mm. this. Uh, it, hopefully you haven't heard of this book because I would love to blow your mind on it. Um, there uh, in the late '90s, there was a book, uh, a company called Cliffhanger, uh, mm-hmm. that used to put out these uh, you know kind of cheesy comics. But that's where like J. Scott Campbell and some of these other artists from, came from. Humberto Ramos. Um, okay. So uh, there's a book that Humberto Ramos and Brian Augustine created called Crimson, and okay. it lasted like 24 issues, so it ran for two years. Um, Humberto Ramos drew the whole thing. It was his concept, his idea. And it's basically about a kid named Alex elder who is 
I guess, the chosen one to decide whether heaven or hell wins the battle between heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then in the first issue, he gets bit by a vampire Um, and (laughs) vampires work for hell. So he's uh, so he's now like there's, you know, a lean that he might end up destroying the world instead of saving it. So uh, so archangels come down, you know, riding dragons. And it's it's a wild fantasy, supernatural kind of kind of book. But um, but it has a little bit of crow in there has a little bit of uh, some of the stuff that we've talked about here on the show. So if you get a chance, uh, Boom Studios a couple years ago put them out in hardcover. Okay. So so I think the digitals still exist if the hardcovers don't. But yeah, p- pick them up. And I'd love to just pick up the first one. I'd love to hear what you think of it whenever you get a chance. Obviously, no rush. But Okay, well, yeah. I, you're right. I, I have not heard of it. So I will definitely... Uh, I'll definitely check it out. Um, <laughs> it's funny it has vampire because I actually, before I, I hopped on the podcast, I was actually rereading uh, Batman Red Rain. Oh, which, great book. Which is Batman versus uh, Dracula. It is yeah. a great book. It uh, is. The, the animated movie is awesome too, by the way. It's not based on that comic, but uh, mm. the Batman versus Dracula, um, there was a, a early 2000s, there was a Batman cartoon just called The Batman. And yeah, most yeah. most people didn't like it because it was, I yeah, and most people didn't like it because it was like a tech Batman. But I love yeah, that yeah. part. I love that cartoon so much. And the Batman vs. Dracula movie is amazing. It's way better than it should be. It's so good. Mm, yeah, I, I've, uh, I, I like that Batman too. Yeah. Um, but to, I, one of my favorite shows of all time is the animated series. Of course. Yeah. Gold, gold. Untouchable. <laughs> uh, yeah. I like, I really do think that's like, I, I like, I call it Batman perfected. We're like, if you want yeah. a perfect iteration of Batman th- right there, like you're, you're never going to get anything better. It's so good. That, that show had such a profound impact on me that even after mm-hmm. my aneurysm, my dog who had recently passed away, um, I named him Ace after Ace the Bat Hound. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, so I, so that, yeah, so it's just like I said, the the positive things that come out of these things that we love uh, yeah. is 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 profound. A lot of times, it's uh, and how how funny it, and it, I would say it infects us, but it doesn't. It uplifts us, I guess. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, is there any Jay? Is there any last uh, uh, you know? Is there any places that people can find you online outside your YouTube channel? Because I know you have your main YouTube channel and your live channel now. So I'm going to yeah. put a link to both of those down below. But anywhere else that you could plug that people can find you. Um, you know, I mean, there's the YouTube, there's, um, into the deaths live where I, I stream on weekends, right? Try to, um, I, I'm on Patreon. Um, you know, there's some benefits there. I, I have like a discord. Um, I put all my videos up uncensored. Um, cool. cause I, I've been kind of, uh, I've been putting YouTube time out a couple times. So oh. I try and I try and, and, you know, follow some of the guidelines, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Awesome. Well, I'll have links to all those down below guys. So please, you know, support Jay, check out into the depths. I'm sure a lot of people who are watching this might even be from your channel. So hello, Mm -hmm. you know, nice to meet you guys and thank, (laughs) and I want to take a minute here to thank you. Uh, because speaking of positivity, like I said, that was a video Batman night cries. I made that had, you know, 40, maybe, maybe it got up to a hundred at one point over the two years or three years it's been out. Yeah. But, but then you came along and were like, Hey, I'd love to shout you out, use a clip from it, which I meant a lot to me. I mean, more than, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and I'm, but I'm sure you could, you could imagine. And, and when you made your video and shouted me out, I mean, we've gotten six, I've been for three years since that video came out, I've been under um, 2,900 subscribers. I've been that this last, like, 200 subscribers to get to, t- to 3000 has been yeah. a nightmare ever because I deleted all those videos. So it kind of ruined everything. And they even, someone at YouTube even told me, they said, the only way you're probably going to climb out is if someone comes along and shouts you out and then you get a spike in viewers and subscribers. And because of you, I, I am now nearing 3000 subscribers. And I, I just want you to know, like you have impacted my life in such a cool way. And it, it just meant a lot. I'm so glad. That's why I wanted you on here so bad to talk to you and just say thank you person to person <laughs> thank you man um yeah I, i'm i'm really really happy to hear that um and i wanted to also i didn't get um the chance before but i want to also thank you not only for inviting me on here but for also making your night cries video because like i said i'm not someone who who can relate to it on the the level that you did and i think to, to do that. And kind of like you were saying where I don't know if this is going to help me, but it might help someone, you know, cause cause no, I believe no experience is unique. There's always someone like you out there. And I think to do that, 
is really, really brave. And, and I, I really commend you for that. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. And I, yeah, I just, I just want people to read that book. Like it, yeah, it means, yeah. it means so much to me. I just want people to read it. Like I, you yeah. know, if, if, if nothing else from this, this podcast sticks, please go read, you know, night cries and the yes. pro and, yeah. and everything please. else. See for vendetta, everything we talked about, yes. listen to some music, like, like, yeah, please do. And uh, get, <laughs> get lost in someone's creation. And uh, hopefully that'll lead you to better places in creation yourself, you know? So Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jay, for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for watching and listening. It means a lot to me too. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Check out all of Jay's links down below and support him as well. Thank you so much. See you in the future. Peace. See ya.